Good evening. Good evening. I am Patrick Mason, the moderator this evening, and professor of economics and uh, associate dean of diversity, equity, and inclusion at Florida State University. And our workshop this evening, make sure everybody's in the right place. <laughs> <laughs> is Florida Maroon Societies, Gullah Geechee and the Underground Railroad. All right. Okay. All right. And we have a distinguished group of panelists, Dr. Martha Beretta. 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 Okay. Dr. Meredith Hardy, mm -hmm. down at the end. Uh, Jeff Shanks and Don Lawrence. All right, so before we get started, let me do a little bit more information on each one of our panelists. Dr. Barita is director of the Blanchard House Museum of African History and Culture, located in Punta Gorda, Florida. For over 30 years, she has consulted, lectured, and written about social issues related to race, gender, class, power, and culture. She's the author of 12 books. She's been busy. Her <laughs> writings examine critical, historical, and contemporary issues that impact our global society. She believes that awareness and recognition of the, university, of the universality of social issues can contribute to the resolution of problems that affect all societies and confirm our human connectivity. Dr. Barita is author of the forthcoming book, A Time for Change. It came out in June. All right. It's out. <laughs> How White Supremacy Culture Hurts All Americans. Boy, that is a timely book. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Meredith Hardy is an archaeologist with National Park Service Southeast Archaeological Center here in Tallahassee. She has over 25 years of archaeological historical, archaeological historical preservation and interpretation experience throughout the southeastern United States and the Caribbean. Her research ranges from prehistoric, colonial, island and coastal studies, and the archaeology of enslavement, food ways, Arch architecture and colonial urban planning and development of creolized cultures. <coughs> the research has been used widely in the development of interpretive education and outreach materials. Since 2017, she has volunteered and served as a commissioner representing Florida on the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor Commission. Jeffrey Saint Shank, also an archaeologist <laughs> with the National Park Service, stationed here in Tallahassee. Over the last two decades, he's worked in Italy, Greece, Ukraine, and the Caribbean. But for the last 15 years, his focus on the archaeology of the southeastern United States. His broad research interests range from indigenous American village and mortuary complexes to colonial, to colonial European sites to the archaeology of enslavement and resistance to slavery. He is currently a program manager for the National Park Service Archaeological Assistance Program, which partners with federal and state agencies, local governments, and nonprofits to protect and interpret cultural resources. And then Don Lawrence uh, is a heritage program manager with the U.S. Forest, Forest Service, responsible for the preservation and interpretation of the historic and archaeological resources in the three national forests in Tallahassee. She is a national forest in Florida, excuse me. She is an archaeologist who's worked throughout North America on various historic and prehistoric sites over the course of her 20-year career. Don specializes in human skeletal analysis 
and the repatriation, repatriation <laughs> of nat Native American remains and funerary objects. Her current research focuses on the bioarchaeological impacts of colonialism on marginalized populations. Originally from New York State, Don has lived in Florida for the last three years. Okay, so we have a really outstanding group of panelists here. And we will proceed um, by, uh, we'll have 50 minutes all together in this first section. And I don't know, 50 minutes, that's 15 minutes or so a piece, uh, a little less. Right, four people, so it might be less than 15 minutes. You just punch me if I go too but, <laughs> So, and we can start, Professor, would you really like to go first? Okay. Well, welcome. Uh, we didn't expect to see this many people here. We thought we were going to be in that little room, but anyway, that's all right. Uh, the Blanchard House Museum, I have to say, was the vision of my mother. I have to mention Bernice Russell. It was her vision, and I have to thank Altamese Barnes, when my mother started this journey, it was Altamese Barnes who helped her with this journey. And I do call, uh, this is about Maroons, I do call Altamese Barnes a present day Maroon. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, I do have uh, kind of a, a personal interest in this. You see what we're gonna talk about, uh, the fact that even 180 years before the Emancipation Proclamation, Florida was a place where Africans and African Americans emancipated themselves. This was the place to emancipate yourself. I also, uh, from family stories, realized, and I didn't know it before I started this research, that I probably had uh, maroons on both sides of my family. My great-great-grandfather, Alan Watkins, was enslaved on a plantation in Virginia, Radford, Virginia. His sister, Belle, a small girl, stuck her hand in some molasses. She was whipped. She died as a result of her wounds. Uh, my great-great-grandfather uh, didn't like that very well, and so he set the plantation house on fire. He swam across what was in the Radford River, which became the New River, and joined uh, a maroon community. I had to check this out, it was at Marshall University doing some work, and they said the story, family story, was probably true from the area to which he went. On my mother's side, my great-grandfather's uh, father was the owner of the plantation, and um, he had a half-brother, Thompson. My, my uh, great-grandfather was Austin Long, and uh, Richard Long said he would sell nobody, no slave that had any of his blood. Thompson Long, though, was his half-brother, and it was rumored that they were gonna sell Thompson. And Thompson Long left the plantation, did not come back till after emancipation. So somewhere in Jackson County, there was a maroon community mm -hmm. because he was able to stay there all of those years. What we learned in school, okay. I tell you what I did not learn. I grew up in Florida. I had never heard of a maroon until I started doing this work as an adult, a grown woman. And there were two commu maroon communities right near where I grew up. One was in Sarasota, Bradenton, uh, Angola, and one was right down the road from me in Pine Island. Never, ever heard about it. So you can take a look there. This was what we, we learned. This is the way we learned. This is what, if you wanted freedom, you headed up north. This was what we were all, all told. But the missing history. Um, the first really time that I heard about uh, the Maroons was from a very close Gullah friend of mine. And he was so impressed with, I don't know if how many heard of the Stono Rebellion mm -hmm. that happened in 1739. He was a sailor. He was so impressed with them that he nailed, named his sailboat Stono II, <laughs> right? 
And we know that at that time, that was the largest um, ins insurrection of enslaved people in the British North America. And what they did, they beat their drums and they had their flags and their whole plan was to escape to Florida. They were not successful, however, but that was the plan. If you could make it across that St. Mary's River, you could be free. And this was, was very prominent. Uh, after that, the state of, of uh, South Carolina started putting some real codes on enslaved people. It frightened them. So if you take a look now at our revised Underground Railroad, you see that people from Georgia and the South Carolina that they understood they didn't have to try to get to Canada. They could just come to Florida, just cross that river. So the primary goal of freedom seekers during this period for the Southern Underground Railroad was to come to Florida. And you can see from that first paragraph that one of the primary locations was Florida, okay? Now, if you look at Katz, who did a, a lot of uh, research on this, he said, uh, and, and I think this is, is very important because right here, it really shows the agency of the Africans. There were no whites to help them. There were no comfort stations, you know, no barns, no you know, signals, no uh, quilts hung out for them. They really had, there's no Harriet Tubman. They had to do this thing on their own. So it was primarily Africans and uh, Native American agency here. It's just interesting, uh, but as I thought about this fact, I wrote this in red because of what we're going through right now. First I said, you know, how come, you know, this, this story, nobody's told the story, but there's probably two reasons not to tell the story. Uh, one was the fact that with the Second Seminole War, these Africans and Seminoles defeated the U.S. Army. In fact, it was a felony to even talk about that, to talk about it. But secondly, any story that really tells about the agency of African Americans is kind of pushed aside. So the very fact, when I looked at this again, that's why I didn't hear about this story. That's about why we don't tell this story in school. Uh, last year, for Black History Month, I, um, for each Davis Children's School, I did, uh, we did at the Blanchard House, African American um, inventors and whatnot. Uh, believe you me, this year, for their Black History Month, they're gonna have every day something about the Maroons. So they will learn this history this year. And it's, uh, I know from my own children and from what I've seen in, in many African American students in classes, and, and some of you probably know this to be the case, that when they open that chapter on slavery, African American kids, many of them bow their heads. And I know this from what my own kids have told me, what my son, they're six years apart, what my daughter have told me. No African child should bow their head when slavery is discussed. First of all, they should know the history that the people that were brought over here had skills. They didn't pick up anybody. It was not like the indentured servants who came, who came because Britain wanted to get rid of their poor people and their convicts. The Africans that were brought here were skilled people. South Carolina, they knew how to cultivate rice. So no black child should ever bow their head. They should raise their heads. They should say, oh, excuse me, you know this one had this skill, this skill, this skill. They built those, those mansions, you know that brick laying, you know all that work. But secondly, they should uh, raise their hands in pride because they resisted this. And they should know about the Maroons, who I say were the very first freedom fighters. So if you take a look here, you can see what happened in, 18, in 1687. Look at that. And then by 1738, look at that. Guess where they were coming from? They were not headed to New York. They were coming from the Carolinas, headed to Fort Mose. And if you have not uh, been there to Fort Mose in St. Augustine, it really is worth a trip to go there. 
Now, what was going on at this time, there was a lot of international competition for lands in the New World. So we had the French, we had the British, we had the, uh, of Spanish, especially if you look, I think, at Pensacola, they had three flags there. Uh, and the, what the Spanish did, this is very uh, smooth on their part, they would use the escaped Africans to, to try to destabilize the British territories. And in fact, they were very successful because with the Africans, with them, they successfully uh, defended St. Augustine from the British in 1790. And in 1766, uh, the British did uh, cede, the, the Spanish did cede Florida to the British. And those Africans uh, left. And if you've ever been to Cuba, take a, take a trip to Montanzas. You go to the museum there, and you're going to see all these English names. And these are people who left in 1763 when uh, Spain ceded uh, Florida. So just, just take a look at this. This is something that happened in 1776. And this, you can just take a, a few minutes to read that uh, about the alliance. Uh, in that first paragraph, uh, we're talking about the largest slave rebellion in the United States. What happened here when we had that African Seminole Alliance? And I'm going to talk about that in just a little bit. Uh, Cantor Brown, who was from uh, my area down uh, in, in central and southwest Florida, is an excellent historian. If you ever get a chance to read any of his work, please do that. Uh, Fort Meade <laughs> is on Highway 17. That is so near me. All these, all these maroons were right near Martha, and I, I just <laughs> as an adult found out about them. But uh, that was a uh, very close number two, right there. Fort Meade was where we had another uh, maroon community, very close to where I live. And Pine Island. I was in Pine Island about two weeks ago. Um, 1821, we got a colony on Pine Island there. And you see what they did. They worked with the Cubans and the Spanish fishermen. Um, see how they made their living? And they were protected by the Spanish vessels. Now, when they had to leave, we, we've heard about the Maroons uh, going to the Bahamas, and this is, is where they went. Okay. So, who was this person? Who were, who were these Maroons? Uh, and I tell you, I am so proud that in my own family, I had two of them. You see, uh, resourceful, very much. Um, they didn't play around. Um, they defended themselves probably by any means necessary. And uh, they were very good. This is why they were, they were so good with the, the Native Americans, um, was because they were very skilled in guerrilla warfare. And I, I probably have to tell you this little story that's probably off, off the, the scene here. All of you know where, where the, um, the slogan, doggone, oh, that doggone, you know where that came from? <laughs> It came from one of those battles. And so um, they, um, guerrilla warfare, they had their little, you know, have some little blacks here and some, some Africans here and some natives there, and they just put the head out so you could see them. And so they would rush, the, you know, the Spanish were using the dogs to chase them down, right? So they'd send the dogs down there, and they say, dog on, dog on. <laughs> Doggone, and that's what they did. That's where doggone came from, okay? All right. Um, the maroon communities really were the greatest threats because, see, it's, you know, running away, and let's, let's get the difference here, runaways. Runaways many times went for a certain part of time and they came back, or maybe they did escape, go north. Maroons established communities. They established communities based upon African traditions. It's a whole different game than just being a runaway. These were people who established their own communities based upon traditional values. Uh, very interesting, too. You hear about uh, Seminole slavery. Um, 
I read once where a Seminole said something about, you know, we're warriors. We don't have time to be worried over people. Uh, the the uh, Maroons lived separately. There were many, though, who did intermarry and whatnot, and they would usually have three fields. The natives had their fields, the Africans had their fields, and then they had a third field that was used for tribute. So the Africans did pay the natives tributes for that protection, because if you were, you were a slave, you were a slave, but you were a different kind of slave. You were not chattel if you belonged to, uh, actually you were protected. And at the time of this end of the Civil War, they are, there were said to be at least 50 maroon communities all around the South. We knew about the Dismal Swamp and all of those, but the more we knew about it, I mean, like as an adult, I found out they were within 20 miles of me, the maroon communities. Um, one of the things that, that they, were, they were very good uh, why they, the um, natives, why they worked, had this wonderful alliance, had similar values, but also because they, they were Creole, they had, you know, they were now brought up in the United States, they spoke English, so that the Africans could be translators. They also were the major organizers of the military tactics. And so um, they really served, they, it was a good alliance. You know, if you were connected with the Native American, you were protected. But they gained as well. So that was a very, very good alliance. So if you take a look here, look at here at these are the black forts, villages, and Seminole villages with black residents. Take a look here. You know the Negro Fort is up near you, okay? Fort Mose, you know, that's St. Augustine. Look at, at, I think you can probably get a, a pretty good, yeah, you can get a pretty good view of all of those. And these were um, where we had uh, maroon communities, black forts and black villages. And then number, 60, number 15 is near me, Angola, right near Sarasota. And then very close to me, Pine Island. Uh, one of the things we'd like to do at the Blanchard House, so if any of you have a student, we haven't, found as much information as we'd like to find out about the Maroons on Pine Island. So if any of you have a student who may be interested in really doing some digging about Pine Island, we've done a lot of digging on Angola. That's been done. But we really do need much more information about Pine Island. And uh, this just kind of shows you kind of uh, what Florida was like. This is what they had to, to go through. So, uh, Angola, 1812 to 1821, you know, after the, the uh, Black Fort and, you know, they had to move away from there down to Lachua County and all the way down, and they came down to our coast. And I, I graduated from Booker High School in Sarasota. Angola was in my backyard, and I had no clue that it was there. <laughs> And just, you can take a look there, just take a look there. I'm trying to, to get through this quickly for you. Okay. Okay. Uh, when Mr., uh, your President Andrew Jackson on the, the $20 bill, when he came down, uh, Angola was one of the places that was destroyed. Um, it had been a very, very successful maroon community. And as you can see, uh, the people who were there, ended up uh, going to the Bahamas, right? I need to hurry up, right? I will hurry up, okay. All right, uh, just show that, okay? All right, uh, very quickly, second, I'm gonna go through these, and you can, i just, he'll just run through them quickly. Second Seminole War, um, General Jessup, and you're gonna see this down here, um, you'll see what he called this. This was uh, the largest uh, insurrection of enslaved people. And one of the reasons why, as I said, they could not really talk about and write about the Second Seminole War. And we know the reason why, because they were fighting Africans in the Second Seminole War. It became a major threat to the institution of slavery. And come on down and look at just the final thing there um, that General Jessup said that you may be assured it is a Negro war not an Indian war, because the whole point there was to take those people who were free and enslave them again. Okay. 
and just go through, uh, you can read these for yourself. John Caesar, he was um, an interpreter. He was the one who had a wife enslaved and he could go to the plantations and gather up folks, folks believed in him. Go for John, John Horse. Um, he was uh, very important and I had the, the good fortune to go out to Fort Brackettville in Texas. Um, one of my good friends, one of her, her great great grandmother had been one of those maroons. And it was, it was delightful. You had people who looked like me coming from Texas that John Horace had taken there who spoke fluent Spanish, but they also spoke that Gullah Muskegee dialect. So it was very, very interesting. And King Philip, who uh, John Caesar worked with, and of course Abraham was, was the most important of the um, African Americans. Okay. And so uh, we did this for uh, Viva uh, 45 and um, just, yes, if you'd like more information about this and you're gonna give me five minutes at the end to talk about the New Image Project, right? Okay, I'm done, I'm done right now. <laughs> and do this, thank you, and then do this because I want you to know, um, hit the next one, hit the next one. And the next one, okay. <laughs> now this is for our governor. Mm -hmm. Our governor said, remember he made the law? Our governor said we had to teach about Okoye. So this is our, gov our gift from the Blanchard House to the governor. <laughs> Thank you. Good job. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Actually, I, learned, I grew up down in South Central Florida in Highlands County, and I had no idea about uh, maroon areas down in that part of the state. Mm -hmm. So, very informative. All right, so. Can you do the next presentation? Uh, oh, you want mine up? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, sorry, Jeff. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you would, though, if you would go ahead and put Dawn's presentation up, because I'm going to steal one of her slides. <laughs> <laughs> this is so what the mine. Park Service does to the Forest Service all the time. It's yeah. <laughs> Take, take, take. You are surrounded. <laughs> okay, so, yeah, I want to, uh, probably, you hit a lot of the things I was going to touch on, which is good, so I, that'll save me some time. I can, I you can, can put through. slides up. Can I'm I steal, right I'm going to steal one of Don's slides. <laughs> um, I do want to talk a little bit about, you know, Maroon Inch in general in Florida, um, you know, and, and Dr. Uh, Bereda hit a lot of the points I was going to talk to you. I'm so glad you brought up the Sono Rebellion, right? This is something I've worked with. It's a National Historic Landmark that we in the Park Service you know, uh, manage that program, and a lot of people don't know this. And this is a great, they know about the Sono Rebellion. They don't know what they were trying to do, get to Florida all the way from South Carolina, right? And there's a, and there's a reason why they were doing that. People don't really know that, as you said, until 1821, before that, for 100 years before that, the Underground Railroad ran south, not north. And that's the point you know, that you were making, and, and that's a, it's a great example of that with the Stoner Rebellion in South Carolina. They were trying to fight their way down to Florida, not north. And this is because Spanish Florida, you know, as you said, the, the Spanish governor of Florida actually officially made this proclamation. If you can make it down to Spanish Florida, you're in, enslaved in the British colonies, uh, you can have your freedom here. You just had to uh, you give service to the Spanish crown, right? And that's what Fort Mose, many people have heard of Fort Mose outside of St. Augustine. That was what that was all about. These were, you know, as you said, for the Spanish, it was, a, it was useful for them. They were able to use formerly enslaved Africans coming there as a buffer against the British there, you know. For enslaved Africans, this gave them a goal to reach, right? You could get to, if you can cross that river, you can cross that river, you can be free, right? And so that was, uh, 1738 was when Fort Mose was established, right? So this was happening in the, in the early 1700s. But the history of Africans and people of African descent in Florida is much, much older than that. And um, this is also something that's not told. We have this 400-year African-American experience in North America, well, it, it, things did not begin with Jamestown in 1620. There were Africans here in Florida in 1513. It's 500 years of African American history here in America, and that there's a whole century here in Florida, you know, before that. Just in this area right here, in, around Tallahassee, 
first Africans were brought here in the 1530s in the uh, Narvaez expedition uh, that came here. One of those Africans actually, you know, most of that expedition died. Only three people survived that expedition here. One of them was one of these enslaved Africans who made it all the way, walked across the, uh, the Gulf Coast and ended up making it to Mexico, right? One of the first uh, non-native people to see the Mississippi River Right, was someone of African descent, right? But these stories, they're, they're overlooked, they're not told, right, as you say. And, you know, this is part of what we need to do and part of what I hope comes out of this conference, right, is getting these stories out there, right? Th they need to be told and they have not been. Um, getting back to Maroons, right, and the idea, you know, this is really ties into what we're doing here with the story of the road to emancipation as you say, it really begins with the story here in Florida of people that were self-emancipated. Before slavery was brought into Florida in 1821, before that plantation system was expanded into Florida through American imperialism, there were maybe a century of free black people living here in Florida, people that had emancipated themselves, right? Self-liberated, freedom seekers that had come here. And Dr. Barrett really talked about that, just how hard that was, right? As you said, there was not an established Underground Railroad, right? There was, they had to, they worked with Native American allies and things like that, but it was tough, right? You're coming to Florida, and Florida was not a very hospitable place, right? There was no air conditioning in Florida in those days, right? You were coming you know, to a place that was very hostile, but you're coming to a place where you could not just escape, but as you said, establish communities. <coughs> rebuild communities, right? Rebuild here, you know, in a place where you, at least at that point, did not have European colonialism, European enslavement, um, keeping people from trying to live their lives, right, as best they can. And, but it, you also have to consider the status of Maroonage, right? We, we say, you know, we do say that, you know, these are, these are people that are self-liberated, they're seeking freedom, but it's not, and this is important to remember, right? It's, there, there's, it, it's really its own status, right? Because although they're here, they've, they're, they've gotten away from enslavement, they've managed to get out of that institution, they're building communities, they're still living here always with the threat of re-enslavement, right? Is it really true freedom? Is it really true liberation when you're always having to constantly resist. There's, it doesn't mean the resistance ended. They still had to resist because always, right, and it's a story that you talk about with the Seminole Wars, we talk about these as the Seminole Wars, but they're really the stories of, of African people also fighting alongside those Seminoles trying to prevent being re-enslaved, right? And it's constantly about that, that battle against re-enslavement, you know, and fighting that holding pattern, right? And you know we'll we'll talk a little bit. You know Don's going to talk about Negro Fort, right? Prospect Bluff, where you know some of this resistance started, you know here in Florida. Um, but even before that, there you know it, even before Fort Mose, potentially, we believe there were probably maroon communities here in Florida. Maybe you know as early as the early 1700s, maybe the late 1600s even, there may have been maroon communities in Florida. That evidence is scant, right? Even for us, you know, certainly the history books don't talk about it for a number of reasons. But even archeologically, it, it's tough for us to find evidence of these communities, mostly because as you were saying, they were living alongside the native populations here, the indigenous populations. And a lot of times they're using the same pottery and things like that. and so. Archaeologically, there's a number of archaeological sites in Florida that are just identified as Seminole sites or Creek sites. They may actually be African sites. They may actually be maroon sites. And it's tough for us to be able to distinguish those archaeologically. Maroon archaeology is, is a relatively new sort of subfield, right? And looking for trying to tease out those Africanisms in the material record, right? To be able to, to do that. And, you know, Uzi Baram, who's working at Angola, and Terry Wyck at Palakli Kaha, Abrahamstown, and um, Kathy Deegan, who, of course, did all the great work at Fort Mose, you know, we're, we're starting to get at that, you know? And, but it's still very new, right? And we're still just trying to be able to start telling this story that's been lost. And you know we're hopefully we'll be doing this at at, at Fort at, at Negro Fort right in the Apalachicola National Forest. We'll be able to hopefully soon start telling that story a little bit better. Um, you know, but it is in its infancy, right? We're we're just working on this now as as archaeologists to try and get at that. 
And you know that this may be one of the best ways to get at these stories is with archaeology. Because as you say, these stories aren't told in the history books, right? And you know, one of the great things about archaeology is sometimes we're able to get a, get a piece of those stories that aren't otherwise told, right? And so that's what we're working on doing. Uh, if you'll pull up Dawn's presentation here. It's no? Good. I'm not allowed to steal your slide? No, it's not. It's coming through. Oh, it's not coming through. Yeah. Oh, it didn't. Oh, for, oh that's okay. <laughs> You can oh. describe it to them. Okay, I will describe it, but it would, have, it would have been nice to show you this. So one of the, you know, we know somewhat about the Maroons around uh, in St. Augustine and Angola and in South Florida. There's been almost no work, you know, outside of what we know about Negro Fort, um, about Maroon villages here in this part of Florida, in the panhandle of Florida, in middle Florida. And there's just been... Um, just been a little bit of work that's been done um, just recently. One of, one of the, um, uh, the former um, tribal historic preservation officers for the Seminole, Bill Steele, has done some research, and we've been working with him. And I wish I could show you this map, but um, the British came here, and you'll hear more about this when Don talks about Prospect Bluff and Negro Fort. The British came here during the War of 1812 into Spanish Florida, and they set up this fort um, here, basically an outpost where they um, did a proclamation, much like the Spanish had done earlier in the 1700s, anybody that comes and joins the British to fight against the Americans can have their freedom, right? And you can become a British colonial marine and you can, you can fight with them and you can become a British citizen, right? And so they built this fort here in Apalachicola. But when the British first arrived, uh, that, that British officer that, that first came here went up the Apalachicola River and mapped it along the way, recording all of the villages, you know, the creek villages and, and Seminole villages along the way. And we have this map that was just found by a local historian in the British archives a few years ago from 1814 that shows, and well, I was gonna show this map, it shows the river going up and you have all of these villages, right? Um, with all their names, you know, the, the native villages. And one of them, you have the Ochozi village. And right next to that is another village it's just labeled Negro Settlement, right? Now this is in 1814, and um, this village is located, for those that know this area, it's right across the river from Torreya State Park, so not far from here on the Apalachicola River. So we know it's next to the, the, this uh, Creek Village, the Achozi Village, and you know, as Dr. Barreto was kind of alluding to, what we often see with maroon villages in Florida is that they'll be paired with a nearby indigenous village, right? We'll see, they're almost like sister villages, right? So you'll have a, a Native American village and next to it you'll have the African village, right? And they would, they would work together, they would farm together. You mentioned the, the idea of the, the, the tribute, right? Where, you know, it, it was, um, you know, they, they had these interactions that we're still trying to get a handle on, try to understand. It looks like that's what was going on here, right? Along the Apalachicola River. What's interesting is the Achozi Creek, we know they were a group of Creek that actually began further north in Georgia, and they fought against the British 100 years earlier in what was called the Yamasee War, right? And this was an uprising in 1715 in, the, in South, what's now South Carolina against the British, where a number of uh, Native American tribes in the area, Creek and Cherokee and the Yamasee, uh, among them the Achozi Creek, revolted against the British there because they were enslaving Indians as well, right? And during this revolt, it was um, you know, a major uprising, right, in resistance against colonialism. And a number of the, the British settlers were, were killed in this and they, they, they fought, but during the process, a number of the enslaved Africans were also joined in with the Native Americans in fighting the British and they got their freedom and they joined with the Creek. And, after that, the British came back in and, and ended up you know, stopping the rebellion, but the, those that fought against them then started moving south to get away, right? They moved into what's now Georgia. They moved down the Chattahoochee River. They worked their way down, right? So both the Native Americans and Africans, right? And eventually, many of them made it here to Florida, right? And so this, we have this evidence here that you know, in this area, people really don't think about maroon villages in this part of Florida, right? But we may have had maroons living here in Florida for 100 years before Negro Fort, potentially, right? That no one even knows about, you know? And so by the time the British arrived here, you know, we, we tell the story of Negro Fort that these were people escaping from enslavement and coming here to join the British. There may have been three generations of people already living free here in Florida 
by the time the British arrived here, right? And this is part of the story that hasn't been told yet, you know, and we're just getting hints and pieces of this, right? And I, I hope that um, archaeologically it'd be great if we could find some of these, you know, some of these villages and be able to, you know, try and, you know, recapture some of that lost history, some of that erased history, you know? And, you know, this is what we're, we're starting to work on. I'm hoping that, you know, that you know, some of our future work, we can do this and we can get this story out here, not just archeologists, but get it out there in the classrooms, right? This, these are stories that need to be taught to our kids, that need to be taught to our children. Everyone, these are, these are you know, stories that everyone needs to know. They need to know this history. They need to know that enslavement, as you say, it's not something you just hang your head about, right? It's not just about being enslaved, it's about resistance to enslavement, right? It's now. Yes, there it is. Yeah, you got it. Okay, this is the Apalachicola River. This was this British map. And you can see right here, a Chosey town right up there. And right below that where the Red Star is, Negro settlement, right? What we've been able to do is take this British map and we've, using GIS, we've overlaid it over um, you know, some of our modern satellite imagery. And we actually have a pretty good idea of where this probably is right across from Torreya State Park. So, you know, that's something we might be able to explore sometime if we could go there and actually test it. Um, you know, archaeologically, we might be able to, we might be able to data, we might be able to see that there were free black people and free black villages and free black communities here in Florida as early as maybe the 1720s, 1730s, even maybe even predating Fort Mose and St. Augustine. We just don't know yet, right? So this is brand new stuff where we're trying to get at this, right? This is a, a you know, a, a, a really, as you said, a new subdiscipline, right? And rune archaeology, especially in Florida. Um, you know, and so, you know, I don't want to take too much time. You know, Dr. Dr. Beretta already, you know, really sort of hit some of the, the general stuff about, uh, about maroon communities. So, but, you know, just wanted to give you, a, give you a, a hint of, you know, this is the kind of stuff, this is the kind of lost history, right, that we're just now getting pieces, bits and pieces of, right? And, uh, you know, hopefully the future will, will, will bring more. Um, yeah, we'll leave it at that. Yeah. Thank you. That that certainly adds like additional information to to my knowledge base of Florida because I didn't know anything about maroon <laughs> communities in this part of the state. All right. So uh, Don, are you next? Okay. Sure, okay. I will go Thank next. You. So as you all heard, I'm from New York State. So you want to talk about somebody who doesn't know anything about maroons, right? Um, but I just started working for the Forest Service a little over a year ago, and I have inherited the management responsibility for a really amazing site, which most of you know is called Negro Fort. We also call it the Fort at Prospect Bluff. That's a name that has been continuous throughout history and likely what they may have called it themselves. And you can go to the next slide, please. And so this is a fort on the Apalachicola River. And as Jeff stated, you know, the War of 1812, the British were looking to set up a southern theater in the war. So you know, they were obviously had a lot going on. I don't think anybody really thinks of the Florida's involvement in the War of 1812. At the time, it was Spanish territory. So the British you know, sailed up river in the Apalachicola. And what they were intending to do was note all of the indigenous villages where they may find aid, because typical of the British and Americans in all their wars, uh, you know, they often sought indigenous aid um, to, on their side, their allies, to fight with them in these wars. And what they also found maybe surprising to them, as Jeff stated, were these Negro settlements, these already these areas of maroonage where people had already crossed the Florida border and were, were seeking safety and settlement and community in Florida at that time. And so the British sail up and they're in, enlisting the aid of all of these people. And I think it obviously it was very fortuitous. As he said, Admiral Cochran issued a proclamation saying that anybody who wanted to be free could come to the British settlement at Apalachicola and gain their freedom. And they were very carefully worded this, and it was often fought amongst you know, the politicians in, in England and the United States about they were luring the enslaved. And they're like, we didn't say anything about enslaved. We just said, if you want to be free, come to Florida. And so they immediately started building this fort on the Apalachicola River. And this was meant to be their site where they were going to engage, in, and they did engage in the Battle of New Orleans and in Mobile. And the fort is described as nearly impregnable. And what you're seeing here is actually the LIDAR image here on the left. And that's like a laser scan. It allows us to see through trees. 
um, and into the topography. And what you see here is the larger outline is the British fort. So the fort that the British originally built, and you're seeing there the moat system that has been carved out into the landscape. There's also a central structure there known as the citadel, which we'll discuss in a little bit too. That's where they would have had this octagonal blockhouse, which you're seeing here in an example here on the right. Leave it to the British, they used the same things, built them everywhere, and so that's an example from Canada. Um, and what they did here, so they had, I mean, a multicultural, vibrant community. So the British are here, as we know, the War of 1812 did not really go well for Britain. Um, they did see some action, but it wasn't really a lot. But what they raised were these core of British colonial marines. And this is something that was really special, you know, to this area and to this fort. And so when they issued that proclamation, you know, saying come to Florida, Undoubtedly, they got you know, people who were enslaved you know, from the United States and Georgia and elsewhere coming down into Florida to join them and take them up on this offer of freedom. But also, it is almost certain that they had people who were already Maroons in Florida, people who may have been born free and have been free for several generations, you know, joining up at the fort. And I, I oftentimes try to think and put myself in the shoes of these people where, you know, at this time, Florida is like the Wild West. You've got Spain, you've got America, you've got England, you know, you've got the Creek Civil War happening at the same time. You've got enslaved, you've got self-liberated. You know, what do you do for your safety? You know, where do you go? And I think that's a really hard choice that we as archaeologists have to put ourselves into the shoes of because it's not just about telling the history, like Jeff said, that's in the history books. How do we access, you know, the lives of these people? And to think about, you know, you're making a choice for your safety, your children's safety, your family's safety. You know, what is the right choice? So I think some of these Maroons may have thought, you know, they're living in these communities on the river with the indigenous. A lot of the indigenous did go to the fort as well. You know, what, ch what choice do you make? And I think some of them may have sought, you know, the safety that, you know, the fort, you know, and protection at, under the British at that time may have offered them, you know, for that brief period. So like I said, the British eventually, you know, lose the war. And we've got now British colonial marines at this site. We've got, you know, Choctaw, a group of Choctaw who were involved for completely different reasons. We've got the Seminole. It's a very lively community of people. The British are forced to withdraw, and Commander um, Colonel Edward Nichols, he was a really strident abolitionist, and he delivered his own proclamation saying that basically he didn't matter, it didn't matter your, your color, your creed, you know, your gender. To him, everybody was a human, um, and he really regretted having to leave. He was going to go back to England, and he was going to request support for the indigenous, you know, for the Maroons that he had left there um, to get England's aid, essentially. Now, the British also honored their offer of freedom. Um, whoever wanted to leave, they withdrew them on the boats as they left. And many people did choose to leave to, to take the British up on their offer, and they ended up in places like Trinidad and Nova Scotia. And so we still, to this day, have a really lively connection with the, the Maroons in Trinidad, known as the Americans, um, who trace their heritage back to the day the British brought them to Trinidad. They celebrate every single year. Uh, so this is really living history, you know, at this point. You know, a lot of people know that about 300 or so chose to stay at the site. And we think they may have been a contingent of folks who actually came from Pensacola. So at this time, you know, it was okay to lure the American enslaved away, but Spain was neutral and not taking a side, and the British weren't really supposed to entice the enslaved from Spanish territory, but they did. Uh, they were accused of exceeding their orders, but you know they brought people with them from Pensacola and from St. Augustine. You know, basically saying, "Yeah, come on over. You know, join us. You'll get your freedom." Um, and that's exactly what happened. So we think a small group of people from Pensacola actually ended up to stay and hold the fort. So probably about 300 people. And one of the things I like to mention is that sometimes in books you'll see that they say that about 60 to 80 people stayed at the fort, and what they're really counting are men. Um, so you want to talk about another layer of forgotten history is the women and the children who were probably there as well. So it's probably more like 300 people. At its max when the British were there, probably about 1,000 people or so you know, in rotation were living at the fort. So 300 people stayed there, and for 15 months, these people lived completely independently. Not a colonizing government in sight, 
Uh, they had their own community. And you want to talk, like you said, about um, people with skills. You know, these were people who were carpenters. They were wheelwrights. They were coopers. You know, they were farmers. They had so many skills. They had an impregnable fort. They were left for all the ammunition and the powder. I mean, they were a self-sustaining place. There's descriptions that say that 50 miles up and down the Apalachicola River uh, were, you know, farms, plantations, where they were, you know, doing agriculture to feed the community. And they really controlled the river. Um, absolutely had full, complete control of what went up and down that river. So for 15 months, this was a free maroon society. And that's really almost unheard of without having any kind of colonial control. So obviously this couldn't stand. Um, you know, Andrew Jackson had already illegally invaded Florida at least once by this point. Why not do it again? It's too close to the Georgia border. And again, the story of maroon societies threatens everything that the American slavery system was built upon. We cannot let people think that they can just escape to Florida and be free. Um, so they, they came up with a plan. They told Spain, either you deal with it or we will. But they didn't give Spain any time to deal with it. They just decided they were going to go on in. Um, and so they sent gunboats up the river from Apalachicola Bay, and they parked them about two miles down the river. Now, we don't, you know, we have people who are really skilled at this fort. Granted, they didn't have a whole lot of time, time to train militarily, but they were still drilling every day, you know, after the British left. They were still raising the Union Jack every day after the British left. So they knew that the Americans were coming because they also had an excellent communication network. So the day, you know, of the battle, they had already had skirmishes in the woods with the Creek allies of the Americans. And two miles down the river, the gunboats park, and each of them are aiming, right? They're sighting each other in with the cannons. You know, the fort had a water battery here um, at the front, and they were able to hit really long range. The first hot shot, so this is a heated cannonball that the Americans aimed at the fort, hit this blockhouse structure, which is where the ammunition was all stored, all of the gunpowder, and that was it. The battle was over essentially with one shot. Um, it caused a massive explosion. Of the 300 people who were there, at least 270 you know, died almost instantly. Um, and only three people total were uninjured. One of those was Garcon. He's a um, formerly enslaved carpenter from Pensacola. He was the leader at this time of the fort. Um, he was executed by the Creek allies of the Americans, along with the Choctaw leader at that time. So this is really the end of one of the biggest free black settlements, you know, anywhere probably in North America. Next slide. But I like to think that this is actually not the end of the story. Um, you know, and as we discussed in the Maroon Societies, what you have after the destruction of Prospect Bluff is you, you don't see Maroon settlements die. You know, they continue to push throughout Florida. So they're, they're moving it throughout Florida. They're being harried by the um, Americans Creek allies, and they're continuing to move through South Florida. And we're seeing, you know, the Seminole Wars, and we're seeing really prominent Maroons, you know, rise as translators and as strategists um, in the Seminole Wars as military leaders. And, and there's some speculation that the Abraham that's recorded at Prospect Bluff is also the Abraham that we know from the Seminole Wars. So this is really a very long legacy. And those Maroons who did move on down to the Bahamas, they actually named one of their towns Nicholstown. So even decades later, they had such a reverence for that one you know, British person who truly saw them um, as humans and as equals that they named their town after him many decades later. So like I said, I like to think that Prospect Bluff, which is so local to us, has a great legacy. And we really, you know, as the Forest Service, wants to get that story out there and have that community engagement and have that involved in the education um, and the school system so people can learn more about the amazing site that we have here so close to home. What was the name of the Maroons that went to Trinidad? Uh, the Americans. Mer uh, Americans, M-E-R-I-K-I-N-S. It's like American, but without the A. Yeah. yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, OK. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right. OK, Dr. Hardy, thank you. All right, well, good night, everyone. Um, I'm not going to take up too much time because um, we've already started to dis we've already talked quite a bit about um, who were so many of these communities, who were these societies, especially along the eastern coast of Florida. We've already mentioned um, Gullah communities. Well, who were these Gullah communities? I mean, we, okay, we generally know from West Africa, Central Africa, we generally know they were brought 
not just for labor, but for their skills, for their abilities to work and grow and cultivate rice, from the knowledge of hundreds of years of knowing how to grow this, of how to grow this crop, but also of carpenters, of masons. You have blacksmiths. They're coming over here with this knowledge already. Um, they're the ones building these estates. They're the ones building these towns. They're the ones with this knowledge to be able to do this. Um, I'm not gonna go into a whole history lesson here, um, but these communities have their own ways of living. They have their own languages. They have their own practices, their own cultures, their own belief systems. They get passed down through time. Um, what we know of today as Gala, so many times, let me step back just a little bit. You know, when, I, when I became a commissioner for the Gullah Geechee Heritage Corridor, I knew that there were Gullah communities in Florida, but it's not something you hear about. You go, Gullah in Florida? That's a Charleston thing. You know, that's a South Carolina, that's a Georgia thing with Geechee. Where in Florida? And I had to learn a lot about it because as an archeologist, my experience along the, along the Atlantic seacoast was with Cumberland Island and looking at the slave villages there and learning about the past and trying to uncover who those people were living in these places. Um, but you had to open it up and say, well, of course they're in Florida. Of course the people were here from very, very early on. Of course it was the same uh, cultural basis and the same linguistic basis and everything. So it's like, oh, duh, of course. Um, so you have this history. You have this practice. You have people that are still there. You have these traditions and beliefs that have been practiced passed down from generation to generation. We have people who are now interested in studying this history and studying this past. But what does that mean if you're not getting it out there to the people? What does that mean if it's just sitting in a library or you've made a short film and then you know it lives on YouTube somewhere? What does it mean if you're not engaging those communities to not just identify that past, but to ed educate and inform about that past and then to preserve those places? So, the communities themselves can say what it is that makes them who they are, and so these communities can define what their future is going to be for themselves. Um, as a commissioner, that's one of my goals, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a shout out here, Mr. Phillips. Um, we have another commissioner for the state of Florida, Mr. Floyd Phillips, sitting in the back of the room. Um, that's, that's what we do, is we work with communities to identify this past, to do the research. We help universities, we help researchers, we help nonprofits find this information and get it out there. Um, there are so many Gullah and Gullah descendant communities along the Eastern Coast, it's kind of amazing. Um, we've been working for years with Cosmo out of Jacksonville. We've started working with the community of Mandarin. We've been working with Armstrong just outside of St. Augustine. Um, we partner with National Park Service, we partner with the state of Florida, we partner with all of these nonprofits, and we've really been making this huge push, just I think over the last few years. When the commission, when the corridor was created in 2006, there was a chapter about Florida, but there wasn't a lot of work going on in Florida. And um, we've been trying to change that for over the last few years and really push, not just Florida, but also North Carolina, the other one that you don't really hear a lot about, Gullah. But the, the entire corridor, which is 12,000 square miles, stretches from Pender County, Florida, down to St. Johns County, Florida. And it's an amazing area where people were moving up and down the coast. They were communicating, they were traveling. Um, during slavery, after slavery, setting up all new communities. Um, but it's not just about the telling of the story and identifying the story, it's how do you get people involved and how do you, how do you get the public aware. Um, one of the things that we do is we work with communities on issues like heirs' property, where, where you know, lands are disappearing, lands are being sold off, the sites are going away, they're being developed. How do we work with people to get to save those sites and um, so that we can tell those stories for the next generations? Um, but also looking at cultural heritage tourism. How can we work with these communities to bring in the dollars so that they can set up their own museums, they can go on and interpret this for the world? Um, and it's not just about the archaeology. It's identifying those stories. It's conducting the oral histories. It's going into those communities and recording those stories. 
I know we've been working with Armstrong. There's been a big effort in Jacksonville to collect a whole bunch of oral histories and these stories and get them out to the world so that we can trace this past up to today. Um, but many of these sites are still extremely threatened. Cosmo, last year we worked with them and they're listed, they got listed as one of the 11 most endangered sites in the state of Florida because of the development all around them. We've been working with them to preserve their cemeteries. We got um, uh, Palm Creek Cemetery, I believe, listed on the National Register of Historic Places. And it's completely surrounded by a brand new sub suburb. Um, these people are getting pushed out, but we work with them to try to at least tell that story and get it out there. And now we, do, we have the city of Jacksonville and the county working to create parks to interpret these sites, to get that information out there to the public. Um, it's been one of the greatest learning experiences that I've had is trying to get this information out, going out into these communities and learning, but also learning it for myself to know that I can make a difference and that everyone in this room can make a difference in preserving and telling that story out to the world. Thank you very much. Okay, and I thank the panelists for really providing lots of interesting information and you know, I'm a native Floridian and I, I learned some things tonight that I had no idea about. So, thank you. And now that we've heard from my panelists, uh, I suspect there are many questions coming from the, the audience. So, let's start with the first question. <laughs> wonderful information area that um, I haven't had the privilege to do much in just hearing about it and as I listened I heard Dr. Beretta talking about an area down Ponta Gorda there and then I heard quite a bit about East you know the Jacksonville the Negro Fort and what have you and so I was wondering uh, I've, I've picked up the activity up our way Park Service what is happening in the Ponta Gorda area to support the area that Dr. Beretta is speaking about? It's a good question. Right before you said that, she just reached out to me and said, you know, we got to start working together. <laughs> well, so, so Pine Island needs to be reset. Yes. Um, so I should say, so the, the program that, that, that I work with, with the National Park Service, the Archaeological Assistance Program, um, uh, unlike Dr. Hardy, who mostly works in national parks, I mostly work outside of the park system itself, helping out um, other agencies. I've been you know, working with, with Dawn at, at uh, Prospect Bluff at Negro Fort. We work with uh, local communities. We, we, as the Park Service, you know, we're the lead federal agency for cultural resources, right? And so part of what we do is try to um, lead by assisting other entities, right? So local communities, states, and so Yes, when we get done here, we're, we're, <laughs> yes, we're, we need to be working together and reach out and see in what ways we can provide assistance, okay. right? Just like we're trying to do and, and help with no. the, the Forest Service and uh, with Prospect Bluff, and this is something maybe Don could talk about, right? The, for the Forest Service, they have this incredibly important site, a National Historic Landmark, but for the Forest Service, that's not really their mission to take care of a site like that or to interpret a site like that. Their mission is to plant trees and cut them down, right? And so Dawn, <laughs> who I will say is former Park Service, so she, she knows what's going on, reached out to us and was like, you know, help us out, help us interpret the site. You know, the Park Service has those kind of resources and skill sets to do this, right? So, yes, we need to be doing this with all of these sites. You know, like Meredith was saying, obviously Meredith is also Park Service, so she's doing this with, she's been able to bring that expertise, you know, bring those partnerships from the Park Service to the Gullah Geechee Corridor. Um, so, yes. The Park Service is here to do that and help in, in whatever way that we're able to, um, you know. And, and so yes, we'll we need to start working together for sure. Absolutely, that's what the great thing about this conference, right? Is bringing people together so that we can network and we can do these things, you know. Yeah. We'll need to use this mic. For any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you, panel. <coughs> very uh, fascinating. <coughs> I have a question about the 
other side of the story. I think we all, <coughs> we all draw a lot of inspiration, and the more of this history that comes to light, the more inspiration we get about Florida as Freedom Man. Um, now there are two contrary, uh, um, if you will, um, sides of it. One has to do with the trail of tears. From, uh, we're working, we my wife, Dr. Wallace, Cindy, and I <coughs> have been working with the Loxahatchee battlefield area, and that's where the folks are capturing her flag, truce, and so forth. And you have locations like Hedgemont Key, um, these sort of prison locations along, you know, that route. The other story is um, um, a, a little more questionable, but it has to do with after the abolition of um, the human trafficking in 1808, the smuggling routes. Now, um, there were well-established procedures in Cuba and Brazil, um, Louisiana, Territory Island, of um, bringing in Africans, and the whole idea was they had these secret camps where they were quote unquote fattened and given Christian names and sort of smattering of the language and then brought into the South and sold as pretended recaptured runaways. Um, and uh, Richard Drake, who was a slave trader who published very embellished stories, it may not be the most reliable stories, but he claims that there were uh, smuggling routes like that through the Florida Peninsula which would kind of fit that wild wild with. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, in both cases, in your archaeological uh, work, have you been able to kind of document or, um, you know, bring any light to those, you know, calling them contrary stories, if you will? So, on the first point, the um, Trail of Tears story, and that's a great point. This is another part of the Trail of Tears story that isn't told, and that's that there were Africans on the Trail of Tears, right? Black Seminoles, African Seminoles, that were on the Trail of Tears to Oklahoma as well. Abraham, who you spoke about, who may have been a prospect bluff, began there, and then ended up becoming this great leader in the Second Seminole War, um, ended up eventually in Oklahoma, right, as part of the Trail of Tears. Some of those Black Seminoles that went to Oklahoma um, ended up becoming the founders of the Buffalo Soldiers, right? These are stories that that are just not told, and um, it's got this. this there's this, such this, this long continuity. So yes, that's fairly well documented, although it's not told as as well as it ought to be. Um, as far as the smuggling aspect, right? Human smuggling, human trafficking, right? After the um, slave trade was made illegal, the importation of of enslaved people was made illegal. I haven't encountered it myself in archaeology. The one, I, I know that um, there were colleagues of Meredith uh, and I at uh, the Southeast Archaeological Center here that did work um, on the Clotilda, uh, searching for the Clotilda in Mobile Bay, if some people know that story, which was supposedly the last you know, illegal slave ship that was brought into, um, you know, it, it was actually done at, all of this is horrific. This is, it's even more horrific. It was, almost, it was done as a bet, right, <laughs> among slave traders. Like, let's see if we could smuggle one last ship in. Um, you know, and, and that story there, you know, there, you know, some of our colleagues, you know, our, our former director actually was involved in, um, you know, helping to, to locate the, the Clotilda there on the, in the, um, you know, mob, up, up the river from Mobile Bay. Um, so, you know, to some degree we have. I haven't, other than that, I haven't been involved in, you know, encountering archaeologically any of these sites. But as you say, that Florida was ripe for that, right? It was the Wild West outside of Pensacola and St. Augustine, right? There was, you didn't have, you know, um, and, and until the Americans started expanding slowly south, right? You, these kind of things could take place, right? Outside of, you know, that jurisdiction. And even, even within that jurisdiction, people were looking the other way. Let's, let's you know, be frank, right? Um, but no, I don't have any experience. Yeah, you know, and that's what I'd like to say too about like, you know, the Negro Fort is that, you know, this is not an idyllic world that people are living in in marine society, you know, on these rivers. There's a constant threat here. You know, if that hot shot hadn't exploded, you know, that powder magazine, all of those people, if the Americans had gotten into that fort, would have been recaptured and resold into slavery. And that had been happening throughout the frontier. And I, I think that may have factored in a decision for some of the Maroons to flee to the fort 
you know, especially during this time of great conflict and upheaval, because the, you know, the Creek allies of the Americans are continuing to scour the landscape and to essentially are slave hunters to capture, recapture Maroons who were born free, um, but to capture them and to sell them back into slavery. So again, you know, it's very much a thing of the landscape. You do have it going both ways. You know, we, we talk about the inspirational aspect of freedom fighting as Maroon, but they're under constant threat. You know, this is a completely unstable landscape that these people are living in and just trying to get through the day to day. That group that went to, well, ultimately, uh, the John Horse mm -hmm. took to Texas. It started out South Carolina, uh, Florida, Oklahoma, Texas, things were not, and mm -hmm. finally he said, let's go to Mexico. Mexico, yeah. Mm -hmm. So there was constant movement. Yeah. And w w one other point to make is um, another area where I work a lot is in the Caribbean, where there were also uh, Maroon hideouts as they're getting ready to like waiting, they're waiting for boats to take them to Puerto Rico and their freedom and stuff. These are people who don't want to be found. Mm -hmm. So trying to find an archaeological signature for people who don't want to be found is really <laughs> tough. <laughs> um, it's, it's very hard, maybe because it's mixed because it, they're trying to look like somebody else, right. or they're just they're being very, very, very hidden. And um, it's 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 it, it, that's a tough nut to crack. <laughs> How do you all differentiate between the Gullah Geechee culture versus what we have a lot of, of course, with being in the North Department in Northwest Florida, you have Creoles there. And of course, a lot of people are related to families from New Orleans and Mobile. But the way we define it, like, like to us, Antonio Garcon, we just was in Creole, right? Mm -hmm. um, so in, in a similar fashion, how they uh, separate, you know, markers for other cultures, now what are you all doing to differentiate between what's considered Kogichi and those people who might have come to these, these places and mixed with uh, the, the, the Spanish, French, Creole communities? Creole, that's a good question. I mean, that's tough because uh, when the corridor was first created, it had stopped at Jacksonville, and then it expanded down to St. John's. And now we're getting pressure to expand the corridor even further south because, you know, it doesn't stop there. There are no actual boundaries. You know, people didn't just stop there and weren't interacting or moving around or communicating with each other. Um, I think that would be, I think your question is really kind of fascinating because you have to look at the sphere, the realm of how people interact with each other. Um, the Gullah Geechee is defined by, I think, the language, the practices, it's that group of them together within a certain cultural area along the sea islands. Um, and you can look at the food traditions, you can look at some of these practices and say, this is a succinct thing. Just like in New Orleans, you're gonna, it's gonna, that is a very succinct, distinct thing, even though you have all of these different Creole and Creolized and hybridized, whatever kinds of languages and practices and things. It is a very distinctive kind of a thing. But then you look at the, like the fuzzy boundaries around that and say, but there's all of this other stuff going on too. And I think it's, we need to re-examine how we're defining these boundaries, I think. And Dr. Moreno, you touched on that as well, it's talking about the languages. What, what we're starting to learn too is that many of the black Seminoles elsewhere in Florida, especially even the ones that went to Oklahoma, the language that they're speaking is... Come it, back, can you hear the Gullah? It's Gullah. I mean, right? from, from Mexico. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in Mexico and in Oklahoma and in Texas, right? You know, and so, you know, those definitions that we have, we're starting to realize that, yeah, it's, a, it's, you know, much, much more complex than we realize, right? Talking about, you know, Dawn was touching on this at Prospect Bluff, where you have... Here, this community, you have people, you have multiple Native American tribes there, but you have, you have um, Africans that have been living in Florida, probably free for a number of years. You have newly uh, people who have escaped from enslavement from Georgia coming there speaking English. You have the Pensacola, people coming from Pensacola who were, had been enslaved there in Pensacola for a number of years, who spoke Spanish, may not have even spoke English, right? And so you've got, you know, that 
Garcon, as you pointed out, the, the leader of the Pensacola, who has a French name, right? We do know that there were actually a number of Haitians that came, ended up in Pensacola after the Haitian slave revolt, right? And so there, there's even some speculation that Garcon may have actually been a, a child who witnessed the revolt in Haiti, right? And saw that and ended up in Pensacola and then in Prospect Bluff, you know, doing his own revolt fighting against, you know, right? I mean, how amazing is this, right? These, these are the all of these interconnections of all of these different cultures and languages and you know we're just starting to scratch the surface on really trying to get a handle you know on this uh, you know and it's, it's a great question and the answer is we're, we're really just starting right to like explore these ideas yeah. thank you hello thank you so much i'm wallace tenney uh wife of jean tenney <laughs> And we're from the Florida Black Historical Research Project. Uh, my question has to do with, um, I, I don't know how to say this, but you know, Africans living in the South uh, under enslavement uh, influenced that culture. And it is called Southern culture. Their influence is called Southern. They never get any credit they don't even get credit for fried chicken. <laughs> and we know that's true. It's called Southern Fried Chicken. It's not called African Fried Chicken. I mean, we don't even get credit for collard greens. Now, in terms of the Seminole, there were, I, I can see with my own two eyes. My grandmother was uh, born on a Seminole reservation. She was some kind of Native American person of Seminole descent, or whatever Seminole is. And, you know, I see the retentions, but I, I have never heard one African retention mentioned in anything I have ever read about Seminole culture. And I'm asking you, have you, in the material culture, archaeologically, or any other kind of way, been able to determine that there was an African influence in the Seminole culture? That's a great question. That's a great question. I have not, but again, it's that mixing of cultures, and you're finding these points of commonality, right? So what is one versus what is another? What is one pot, what is another pot? What is, I mean, it's- Like the cheeky. The yeah, yeah, cheeky. yeah, the yeah. cheeky. Mm -hmm. Now, everybody says that is of African origin. Everything mm -hmm. I ever read about a chiki, except when it becomes a ch Seminole chiki, but mm -hmm. everything else, everywhere else you read, it's something, you know, if it's in Haiti or if it's anywhere else, it's African. Mm -hmm. But here, it's not. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, you know, I'm just really curious about this. This is very, it's a mind-blowing thing in this country, actually. And it is, and it is something that needs to be, I think, kind of take, flipped over on its head and say, well, what about it from this perspective? Like, why is there an assumption that it is from here and it is not from here? Um, I have not personally seen this stuff archaeologically, but I also don't work in South Florida and work in a lot of these, in a lot of those types of areas. But I don't see why it shouldn't be. I mean, it just, it's again, one of these like, of course, it should be. I think it's really a matter of looking. Um, you know, like so many of us have said, you know, when did we first encounter the idea of maroons and maroon culture? And so, you know, I'm sure in my forest, and that's one of the things I want to look at is, you know, where where can we do better at trying to find the maroon component? You know, and it, it, it is often so hidden and tucked in, you know, together with the, the native culture. But one of the things I found, you know, kind of just from personal interest is actually um, herbal medicine. You know, and that's another really unacknowledged aspect of, you know, black culture and native culture is that a lot of the herbal medicine traditions that people call Western, you know, were really actually part of, you know, African culture that were slave medicine and, you know, really a long, long tradition of that that they adapted to, you know, in North America. And I think there's a hidden aspect of that as well. And that can also also be kind of subsumed under the Native American culture too. So it really takes looking with that lens to be able to find it, that different story. Yeah. Also the word Seminole yes. mm -hmm. is a very problematic. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a great example, right? Etymologically, the word Seminole and the word maroon uh -huh. 
come from the same Spanish word, cimarron, right, which means you're know, wild or you know, living outside of quote civilization, mm -hmm. right? You know, that's the finger quotes there, right? Um, etymologically, you know, the, these words have the same Spanish root, right? Um, and I, I think getting the, to Don's point, we're st just now. I mean, we're we're way behind the curve. We are absolutely behind the curve archaeologically looking for these things. No two ways about it. We're just barely starting to identify maroon and Africanisms in the archaeological record in you know, sites that were previously just thought of as seminal sites, right? Much less to actually start looking at the African influences on the Seminoles and rather than vice versa, right? So you're right. Are those influences there? They absolutely have to be, mm -hmm. right? We haven't. We just now started to even begin to look at look at these things and start to explore them. Um, yeah, we're behind the curve on this, you know. And it's really just in the last couple of decades, really, that maroon archaeology is really starting to become, you know, as I said, a, a subfield and a, and a focus. And there's not a whole lot of folks working on it, right? You know, I mean, it, it's, you know, there, there's not many, you know, um, you know, there's, you know. Some, you know, there's one guy that's doing a lot of work in Great Dismal. Um, there's a couple of folks here in Florida, Terry White and Zipa Ram, and you know, now we're going to be working hopefully at Prospect Bluff. But there's, you know, there's just not a lot of, it's, it's a fledgling subfield. Should we have been working on this decades ago? Absolutely, you, you know. Um, but it, better late than never, right? I mean, we're starting now, and, and you're right. These are the things we need to be looking at, and we need to be going at it with that perspective. Um, you know, that it, it, it's, these are cultures that are just, that are interacting and feeding off of each other and, um, you know, taking what works, right? Because Seminoles, they're fighting for survival here too, right? Everyone's fighting for survival, so you take whatever you can from other cultures, everyone's working together, you know, to try and resist colonialism, right? European colonialism, right? And so he, he, those influences, yeah, they have to be there. Have you um, been to the museum of uh, the Everglades City? There's a store and there's the museum. And the closest I've ever seen to African culture are the, the necklaces, the, the headdress, this part that, mm. that Africans wear. You see it on the Seminole women, and, it, it's the, and that's the closest I've ever seen of our, that transfer of culture. But of the Everglades Museum. It's tricky, though. Wonderful uh, <laughs> photographs of the women. Yeah. I had a question, Cecile Schoon, and I'm sorry I had a um, conflict, so you may have covered some of this already. But um, you were saying that there's not a lot of um, uh, footprint, I guess, so to speak, of the maroon cultures. Um, it, but in the Caribbean, there's a tradition, like in, especially in Jamaica, where um, people, once they became free, they would run up into the mountains and mm -hmm. they would live free. And they would all continue to try to, you know, free the, the people who were enslaved so that they could live with them. And that tradition is, from, to my understanding, is a part of the Rasta. Mm -hmm. You know, being outside of the culture, being close to the land, you know, just not bothering anybody, but fighting for, you know, you would fight to the death for your freedom. And that whole sense. So there, there is a footprint there. And I don't know if there's anything like that that existed in, in a parallel world in the American system. Do you know? <laughs> I mean, I, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff, mm -hmm. in some of these larger communities, like at Great Dismal and stuff, you did right. have yeah. larger yeah. groups of people that yeah. were, they were there for longer periods yeah. of time. So, mm -hmm. so you would see that footprint. But I don't believe you were seeing, especially early on, like a sense of permanence and of like, okay, this is our like base where we're gonna go out and fight and then come back to this base. Um, but I am not, I'm not gonna say I'm 100% sure about that. I, I mean, I was gonna say, I think there's such an effort, you know, an, because of the later Seminole Wars, because of Andrew Jackson, because of the destruction of Negro Fort, there is such an effort to wipe out that culture. You know, how can right. we have much left other than, this is why you have archeologists on this panel, you know, because there's not much left. There was such a total effort to, 
you know, the savage Negro war, as Andrew Jackson described it, you know, we don't, don't think we have a lot of vestiges left, you know, of that culture, except, you know, in Andros Island, you know, Bahamas, where they fled, and in Trinidad, where the Americans are, you know, living today and maintaining that rich kind of cultural connection. So I don't know that it's, it's left here in Florida. I, I would love to be proved wrong, but I think we do still have those vestiges in those other countries. And, and really, this is not just Florida history, not just national history, but you know, it is international history at this point. And, and that's why the Negro Fort is a national historic landmark because of you know, so much that has come after that. Yeah, I think that's, that's the real problem, right? Is the Americans squashed it before it could have the chance to survive like it did in Jamaica or Suriname yeah. or some of the other places where you really had, and even Great Dismal, right? Where you had almost a century you know, of folks living there in Great Dismal. Here in Florida, there was mostly because of Andrew Jackson and his cronies, you know, that you know destroyed Negro Fort. Right after that, a few years later, destroyed Angola, you know, and it was a very concentrated effort, you know, beginning with with Negro Fort, right? This was part of that that push, that imperialistic push into to expand the plantation system into Florida to take Florida, you know, from Spain, and in order to do that, you know. It, it wasn't just pushing out the indigenous people, they were pushing out the free black communities here and the maroon communities in Florida and eradicating them, you know, and pushing them further and further back. They didn't get, have the chance to survive and thrive here in Florida like they did in some of the other places around the Caribbean, South America, you know, because of this concentrated effort, really by Andrew Jackson and his cronies, right? And, you know, Edmund Gaines and people like that. Uh, you know, that didn't give it the chance, I think, to, to survive. That doesn't mean that people didn't fight and didn't uh, resist and fight to the death for that, right? That's what the Seminole Wars were all about, right? That's what happened at Prospect Bluff. You had 300 people that could have left with the British, mm -hmm. but they chose to stay knowing that the Americans were going to come sooner or later. Mm -hmm. They chose to stay and defend their community, right, and fight for that community, and they gave their lives doing it. Right, and they chose to do that. So there was resistance, right? It just, it wasn't successful in Florida, unfortunately, as it was in other places. Yeah, what, what year was Fort, uh, Florida, uh, Fort, not Fort Jackson, but Fort Negro, Fort, uh, Fort Jackson, what year was that when they were destroyed? It was, it was 1814. founded in 1814. It was destroyed in 1816. Okay. Yeah. Well, right. we need to, uh, the questions for this microphone so that it can be recorded. Open the back, that's the one that records. <laughs> Okay, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I, I think, you, you know, we, we're all agreeing on the difficulty because of whether it's Maroons who didn't want their, you know, location to be known about or the illegal people and so forth. But I think one of the, the, the real um, uh, disadvantages we have is that most of what's recorded is by colonizers. And as you suggested, I mean, it's, okay, like, right, Negro Fort established 1840. Well, how many generations before 1814, mm -hmm. you know? So the idea of, you know, well, we could leave with the British. Well, the British just got here. We, we just barely know these guys, right. you know? That's so, right. I mean, there, there's all, so what, what, what I'd like to ask is, is there any kind of outreach into the descendant communities to recruit like young people? Um, uh, this has kind of started, you mentioned the Clotilde. Mm -hmm. uh, I work with the National Association of Black Scuba Divers and Diving with a Purpose. And you know, recruiting young people who may never have thought about marine archeology span as a profession, um, but seeing that this can actually you know, get to you know, knowledge that they wouldn't otherwise get becomes a motivator. Um, the fact that people could have been taken from Loxahatchee here in Florida, sent to Oklahoma, some go to Mexico, some return to Texas, to Fort Clark, Brackettville, and become Seminole Negro Indian scouts because they know what to look for. Right. And I'm thinking that if the Maroon descendant communities if we got more folks, young people, who basically know what to look for. Yeah. I mean, um, what looks to us like maybe a piece of pottery mm -hmm. is something 
altogether else to somebody who knows what that is and why it got there. Because all human tra activity leaves some kind of trace. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, long before forensic files, <laughs> people, knew, <laughs> yes. people knew how to uh, trace things. So I, I'm just wondering, is, is there any kind of um, interaction with uh, those, um, you know, descendant communities in Oklahoma or elsewhere? Uh, yeah. Identify people. About the Americans. Yeah, for me, that's a yes. You know, and that is a really important point that you bring is that, you know, we have to kind of decolonize archaeology here, you know, right. and, and we're very aware of our limitations as archaeologists and as trained scientists. Like, we cannot separate the science from the people who lived it, especially with archaeology, because we're telling the story of people, especially those people who did not have the opportunity to write down their own history. And so, again, with Americans, you know, of Trinidad, we're really just at the nascent stages of, of talking to them. and you know, approaching them. Like I said, they have a number of organizations there in Trinidad, so the American Heritage Foundation. They also have a national trust. They work in partnership with a university um, in the Northeast who actually comes down to Trinidad to excavate. But we're really hoping to make more of those connections. Um, you know, set up a partnership, which we're just doing now, a formal partnership where, you know, the National Forest in Florida can provide them, you know, with, with information, you know, with assistance, with, you know, building curriculum, you know, in their schools. And then also we're hoping to really get them over here to, you know, come to the site. And, and again, this is 205 years later. You know, they, when I called them, they said, this is what we've been waiting for. Um, you know, to have that connection, you know, back to Florida, back to North America. And so that's exactly what I'm hoping for. And, and one of the reasons I'm really so passionate about um, representing the Forest Service in discussions about the Negro Fort is because I want that connection with the community. You know, this is a site that is, again, national, international history. And it is through these connections with the community, you know, and with young people, um, that really builds this story and helps us go in the right direction. You know, this is a story that has so many layers to it, and how can we begin to tell it? And the first step is by making it part of public knowledge. You know, making it a part that people say, so I heard this story, but I have some questions. You know, we can continue to do that. And ideally, you know, the site has been closed for a number of years because of Hurricane Michael, and we're still removing trees to this day, and as Jeff says, that's what we do, but there's a lot of trees. Um, you know, one of my goals is to get more school-aged kids out there to be learning and to be asking questions. So absolutely, I, I wanna get the descendants out there, and we work with tribes regularly as well, because there is a large indigenous component, and so there's enough history to go around. Yeah. I know along the east coast, um, at Cumberland Island National Seashore, they've been working with us, with the Gullah Geechee, with the corridor, um, to identify um, these descendant communities who are based from Cumberland Island, and they are going out there, they are finding them, they're beginning to make the contacts and get, start to record these stories with the idea that, they're, that they bring them back, and they take them to Stafford, and they take them to Rayfield, and they take them to these places where the villages were, where, the, where their ancestors were living. I know at Tamuquin um, in, um, in Jacksonville, that national park actually has a community liaison, and his only job is to go out to those local communities, reach out and make those connections so that, so that those community members know what's going on in the park, and they are completely um, uh, engaged, and they're consulted, their opinions are asked, and um, they're, it, it, because it's relevant. I mean, it's, it's their history, and they need to be and they need to be involved with that. This is really um, a Texas connection. It, I mean, it's people from Florida are there, but every September at Fort Brackettville, the descendants come back for a reunion. And so there is that whole group of people who are descendants of Maroons that come to Brackettville every September. And they do that at Kingsley as well. Yeah. There's, a, yeah, there, there's the annual reunion. So. Hi, the mic is recording. My name is Marion, Dr. Marion Williams. I'm from Pensacola, Florida. Uh, my question was, uh, with Prospect Bluff, uh, uh, what year was that for it to destroyed? Uh, 1816. 1816, yeah. Yeah. very good. I have relatives that actually survived that as slaves, mm -hmm. went back to Valdosta. Wow. Another wow. point was made earlier about what happened with the hospitable environment. My grandmother was Park Creek. I belong, I'm a registered member with uh, Autumn Winds in Pensacola, yeah. and I have other Creek connections, so we go way back and pretty deep. 
but the question was asked about how did they survive, these, these black Maroons and these Seminole folks. We have a long history together, but they actually survived the hospitable environment. The Creeks used bear grease as an insecticide, yeah. and that's how they really survived. Yeah. Just a little point. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> uh, berries. Oh, yeah. I think my question is a food for thought more than it is a question. And I'm sitting and listening to all of this awesome history that I always get when I come to Fapin. But my concern right now is when we start talking about this uncovered history, and I live in Gainesville, Florida, where the president of the University of Florida questions a professor who sends, not him himself, but the department, who sends through his plans for teaching that have two words in it. And those words have to do, are either critical, you know where I'm going, <laughs> theory. So this is pretty critical that we're talking about. And I hear you saying that we need to learn, and we do need to learn, I learn every day from this, that the children, mm -hmm are going to be robbed of this. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to know your thoughts on how do we get from where we are to some semblance of knowing that what we're teaching and learning will become a part of what the children learn. Mm -hmm. I, I think working with school boards, working with teachers to, it's all history, okay? It's just, you can't have this kind of history and this kind of history and this kind of history. It's all history, and you can't exclude one part from for the other. And if you can get some of these teachers to, not teachers, some of these curricular developers and textbook writers and stuff to not be afraid to say it's all history and it all needs to be included. And you can't have a little chapter here and a little chapter here and say, okay, we checked that box off, and now we go on to the next thing. But, I mean, that's a total mind shift that has to happen, I think, societally, and now we're into a different world. Um, but I, I don't know how else you, you get that. The, uh, but another way I guess you could do it is individually, like reaching out like through the summer camps and getting the kids to take it home and say, this is what I learned today. And you do that one-on-one -on -one reach out while you're trying to get to the big societal change as well. But that's where it's gonna be okay. a, effect, I think, on the one-on-ones. I do a lot of work on St. Croix. And for years and years and years, we've been working with local elementary, junior high, high school, and University of Virgin Islands students to get them into the park to do archaeology, to do history, to learn museums. And they got it. I mean, these high school kids are coming in. They know this stuff. I can ask them to go catalog artifacts. They know how to do it. And they're going home and, t and telling their families and their friends and their teachers what it is that they're doing. But it's a concerted effort, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, hands-on, come in here and learn this, and I think that is one path to make that happen. Yeah, for me, it's kind of about leveraging our partnerships too. You know, we are going, National Forest in Florida is going to be partnering with the Riley House Museum folks. You know, they've got a big plan. You know, Aaron Myers and I have talked a lot about this five year plan for, you know, building curriculums, writing books, you know, getting kids out to the site. And, and for us, that's part of that outreach too, you know, to really, to connect people with the history in a number of different ways and partnering with the legacy communities. You know, how can we, you know, bring people there if, you know, you can't necessarily bring it in the classroom. And so you, what that means is that each time you do that, it has to be really impactful. You know, the story that we tell has to be engaging and it has to really hit those points of, of what exactly it is we're teaching here. And like Meredith says, it is history, but we have to really hit those high notes in the few limited opportunities. We may have students, you know, before us and outreach opportunities or with books or with documentaries. Um, and that's another thing too, really reaching out through the internet. You know, we know you can't stop anything on the internet. You know, so we've got a lot of plans for story maps and you know, documentaries and things like that to allow people to connect on their own time too with the history. With the Okoe uh, exhibit that we're doing at the Blanchard House, we've already sent the flyer to the schools. We've had one uh, middle school um, teacher who already wants to bring their students. We will be working with the schools uh, district, we will be sending them a list of pre-exhibit questions so they can understand 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, and then they, the kids will come to see the exhibit, and after that there is a post-discussion. I really think that our museums right now, because I, I understand where you're coming mm -hmm. from, uh, 
you know, the, the hand is up there. But we, that's why we're taking advantage of the, the governor saying we can teach Okoe. Mm -hmm. And but we will, I think our museums are really going to have to work harder. We may have to do the work that Jewish schools and Chinese schools and whatnot do in our museums and in our churches and wherever. I'm sorry, we may have to do the work ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's the real point, because really what you're identifying here isn't a history problem, it's a political problem, mm -hmm. right? We can, we can do the, we can provide the curricula, we can do these things, and, and let's be frank, those things haven't been done yet, right? So we've gotta do this work in getting this information out there in a, a, a presentable form for education, but to then take that and actually get it in the schools, as you say, that's a political problem, right? And if we're having this resistance at a statewide level, this is what you do. You attack it at a local level, right? And it, it may be piece by piece, county by county, school board by school board, district by district, right? Where you work and you, you, you're right. We get out there and do the groundwork, right? The, the first part of our exhibit mm -hmm. has the governor's law right there when you walk in you see the law right that's the way we're doing it and that's one that's one site that's one story right we may have to you know was not so much teaching about the incidents but the explanation of why right oh no that's part right. of this oh, yeah. no 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 it's part of it. regulation says that if you teach anything about discrimination because being other than prejudice then that's critical race theory, and you're the same as a Holocaust denier. That's insane. <laughs> that, that is what it says. So we, we have now, now, that regulation, if you say you can't teach that it's anything other than prejudice, do you have a hard time explaining why Florida became state? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It wasn't nope. prejudice. Prejudice means you don't know. Right. You had insufficient information. You had bad information, you had it accurate information. It wasn't insufficient information. Those people are free, and we don't want them to be free. Right. So we're going to capture them or kill them. I mean, when you deal with it, yeah. you can't teach that. Right? So you have to teach that it was prejudice, which then biases in a very, and it, and it specifically says, the people who teach critical race theory, and by that they mean people who teach anything other than prejudice causes discrimination, which is not critical race theory, are the same as Holocaust deniers. Right? So that's where the problem is. Yeah. And not just teaching about the events, but right. the explanation of why it happened mm -hmm. and who did what. Yeah. Because as you pointed out many times, this is really a story about America, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? It's not just Florida history, it's right. a story about America and how we came to be who we are. And there's a massive opposition to some, by some people to, to say, well, you know, racism is real, yeah. right? And it's not just motivated by prejudice, but it's strategic, it's instrumental, it has economic motivations, right. it has political motivations. Thank you. Good afternoon, er evening, everyone. Um, I'm gonna make this really short, but I do wanna give a case and point to the questions and themes that you all brought up. Um, I'm 30 years old now. I grew up in Tallahassee, Florida. Althamese Barnes is my grandmother. Um, so I was raised up in history really young. Um, I went to Sealy Elementary and I'll say maybe third grade, fourth grade, we took a field trip to the Waverly Plantation. And back then my question was, why are we visiting a plantation? Why should we be proud of this history? Why, why should we be subject, subjected to learn um, about this history? But the importance of that back then, um, and this is before Floridians, I'm guessing, really knew about um, maroons and um, 
I, we knew about our connection to the Seminoles and the Black Seminoles. However, we know how the history books are. It's, it's their story, not our story. And so you have to start um, the thirst for knowledge young. When you implant certain things in, in people young, they have the want to know more as they get older. And so now, aside from the um, Jamaican Maroons and the Maroons that were in the Dominican Republic and the Maroons that were in Peru and the Maroons that had been so many places we're just now finding out about the maroons in florida but it's coming up for a reason it's coming up so that we can teach our children and our grandchildren about it so that they can in turn learn more and more and more and teach it to their children it's not going to be an overnight thing you know just as history wasn't made overnight just as they did so much to wipe out our history. We have to do a lot more to get it back. And that's fine. I urge each and every one of you all to challenge yourselves to do so, to learn as much as you can, continue to come into these kinds of events and passing on the knowledge to your friends, your family, your, again, your children. I love what you're doing with the children. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sh share it. I love it. I love that. You read and it continue. Already? No, ma'am, not yet. Your grandmama has it. OK. <laughs> your grandmama. It's, I love your grandmama. It's mine. You, do you know your grandmother is I the present day maroon? I love words can explain. That's what I wrote in the book. That's who yes. she is. She's a maroon. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's within us. So that's all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this was written. Blanchard House, we ended up doing two exhibits, uh, one on the Maroons, one on the, the whole, did a, another thing on the Southern Underground Railroad, which we did present uh, in 2012 at the Underground, Southern Underground Railroad. Uh, as a result of that, I wrote this book, uh, Seminole Maroon, it's about Obi, Seminole Maroon Freedom Fighter. It uh, is fictional, it is based upon, it's about a young man who escapes from South Carolina, you know where he comes, comes to Florida, ends up going to, he becomes a leader. Now, one of the things that uh, we have used this, with this book, uh, and I have to say very, very successfully, uh, the work that I did primarily before was with uh, racial disparity and discipline. Uh, we developed a program called a New Image Project. This program was used in Charlotte for three years because we studied it. Using this book, using the strategies of Obi, Obi had to learn strategies not to be caught by the slave catchers to be back enslaved. Using his story, our boys, we did it with African-American boys, mostly African-American boys. In our county, they call them high flyers. These are the kids who have a lot of uh, uh, referrals and suspensions. We used, uh, developed the uh, curriculum, and I have some copies here if you're interested in, in doing this curriculum. But we used this, and the whole point with this was to teach these boys strategies so that they were not trapped in the school to prison pipeline. So just the way, and they would study Obi, and what were his strategies, they learned strategies to stay out. We had a 76% success rate with the New Image Project. Just this week, I talked to a mother, one of her boys had both of her boys, they had mouths, both of her boys were in the program, one is in college, one's graduating, and then, one of our mentors, what we did, we, this is for middle school kids, and we had uh, mentors who were high school kids, didn't want the A students, didn't want athletes, we took that middle ground, and these boys, we trained to be mentors. Just this week, uh, a Marine recruiter called me, uh, his, one of his uh, recruits had said, you know, call Dr. Beretta because I was one of her mentors and I gave him an excellent recommendation because he learned to be a leader. 
And so I've got some of these if you're interested, but I have to say the whole thing here with our boys, what this program, just learning about Obi, it changes their image of themselves. They see from history, and let me say this, I'm not a historian, I'm a speech therapist and a counselor, but I do believe I'm a cognitive behaviorist, I believe in belief system change, I believe in looking at values, and I do believe and I see history can heal. And history, knowing accurate history, can influence healthy development in our kids who are marginalized. And so um, I, I do recommend this because I, I know it works. And if you're interested in the program, here are just some um, descriptions of the program. But our boys especially need to have a different image. They go into these schools and I've seen five-year-old kids, and this is the work I did for 30 years, that a five-year-old is seen like a man. Our kids are what they call adultified. They are never get to be little boys. And so by the time they're in middle school, they have developed a different image. Obi gives them an image of who they really are. And that's what we have to do for our kids. And so if you're interested, here's uh, this and here's some information about it, about for our kids. Thank you. Okay, I just have really one comment. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say what a fantastic pro, uh, panel you were, how informative this information was and what have you. And to give some feedback as well, I'm not gonna call the name of my museum. <laughs> But um, last year we did a, an exhibit that was exceptionally well received. We had hundreds of visitors from around the country that came to see it. It was a comprehensive exhibit that began on the continent prior to the enslavement of African people and brought us all the way forward to the Black Lives Matter movement. Mm -hmm. Included in that exhibit was one a panel that discussed the Okoe massacre and July Perry and that entire incident. And the one consistent comment that was made by visitors to the uh, exhibit was, didn't know this, oh my gosh, never heard of that. Didn't know Florida had had a massacre. Mm -hmm. People had started to learn about the Oklahoma massacre, but recognizing again that these were people from around the country. Mm -hmm. But a lot of didn't know, didn't know. Unfortunately, as a result of the success of that and the lots of very positive uh, media about it, uh, at the end of that exhibit, going into the next season, I applied for a grant that we had always received. And the reply for the first time ever, we did not receive that grant because they said that our uh, exhibit had uh, been confrontational by virtue of telling history that people were not ready to receive. This is a fact. So there are consequences associated with telling our history. And all of our history, everything that was presented, had, uh, was done in conjunction with the New York Historical Society's 65 historical scholars to confirm that the information was correct and everything was documented with date, resources, places, pages, etc., curriculum to go with it, and nothing was based on opinion, it was all factual. And as a result of that, for the first time, we did not get one of our most important grants to start our season. So. If anybody knows or would like to support us going forward, please find me after. <laughs> but I don't want to say, since this is recorded, the name of our museum. I don't need any additional backlash. But in student groups, numerous student groups were brought there by their uh, teachers and counselors and what have you to the extent that they could, as well as adult groups. We had lecture series uh, that went with it. We had professors from around the country that would zoom in. It was a sort of a hybrid and talk about the history to support what was
was being stated and to give additional facts over and beyond what you can get from just looking at the exhibit. So it was supplemented throughout all of those historical periods with that lecture series as well. So there are consequences to telling our history during this current political climate that okay. we have to be aware of. Are, would you be able to, just out of curiosity, you may not want to answer this, could you say whether that was a state grant or a federal grant? It was um, a local, it was sort of more of a regional okay. grant. Um, I'm trying to think, do the funds come from a state f source? I think it was more of a, a local regional grant. Gotcha. But um, yeah, and so, so yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, tourism funding. And we brought tourism. in so many tourists to the area. People, I mean, we were getting folks literally every week who were coming from all over the place. And we were taking hotel rooms, staying for the full week. You know, we'd give them a list of everything else to do while they were there, such as, you know, beaches and restaurants, et cetera. So anyway, just wanted to make that, um, make you aware of this, those of you who may not know, and to uh, thank you all for all this excellent information. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, who else will be in the line for questions? Were there four people or are we, or is this it? Okay, we'll have one last question. Just, um, I'll take this off so we can be heard. Um, <laughs> um, this ma main point is that, um, and actually to, to comment on what you were saying, um, we, 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 have, we have one of our elders that passed, John Henry Clark, and he summed this up in a very simple way, is that it, for our children, we either are teaching them to be powerful or we're teaching them to be enslaved. And so how we teach history has to make them more powerful. And so what you were saying in regard to when we teach slavery, if we don't teach the Maroons, we're harming them. Mm -hmm. Because what happens is they're under their desk and they're feeling bad about themselves. And so every aspect of this is that, is that for adults, we can have our ideological arguments about saying everything. But for our kids, because they're in a formal age and because we are adultifying them so early, it's very important that they come out feeling stronger off of the history they learned. So it's very important that we teach them our victories. Mm -hmm. And we talk about the things that have happened to us, they can't be, this just happened to us. All we're doing is we're just victimizing them. It's very, very important that we empower them that despite these things we mm -hmm. experienced, this is who we are, this is what we did. Because that's how it was in the past. It was like, we're people who can turn dust into gold. And I think with our kids now, we're, we're, we're losing the fact that they are most important in the equation. It's not just adults saying winning arguments amongst adults. It has to be about the children themselves have to be made powerful after this. And so that's the they want to share that. Yep. Absolutely. I'll take a point of personal privilege and this will be the last comment. Um, I was asked by someone in a network, we were on a Zoom Florida network, and at a point one of the museum leaders wanted to know by the way, what are we going to do about critical race theory? It sort of caught me off guard because I really hadn't given it much thought. <laughs> Paused briefly. I said, we will continue to do what we've done, teach mm -hmm. history. As Dr. Beretta said, we don't even need to entertain the conversation as far as I'm mm -hmm. concerned because We've always taught the past. Yep. There is the African proverb that the wholesomeness, the wholesomeness of the living is diminished where there is a lack of understanding of history mm -hmm. and honoring of the ancestors. So we want the living to stay wholesome. <laughs> so we teach history. That's all we do. I don't know what critical race theory is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'd like to thank our panelists for a great discussion and lots of uh, uh, new information for me. And so we really appreciate you coming and, 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 and spending time with us.